welcome to True Crime Review. An unflinching gaze into the depths of human depravity. The podcast covers current crime news, updates on cold cases and resources for research and investigation. True Crime Review often discusses disturbing and violent crimes, so listener discretion is advised. This is episode 11 of True Crime Review. And I'm going to dive right into the first episode of 2017 with uh, just a few shout outs to our reviewers. The following awesome people left five star reviews on iTunes recently. In the U.S., we have Bossy Pants 16. Low 5972, Dirty 713, and J. Levesque. Levesque? Levesque. I like Levesque better because it sounds more exotic. From the UK, we had five star reviews from Rita 2015 and S3NO 222. And finally, Australia. We had a five-star review from Jody Jassif. Thanks to everyone who has left a review. I read them all and take the feedback into consideration, even when it hurts. Especially when it hurts. But the five-star reviews will always get a quick shout-out here, because who doesn't love getting five stars for something that they've done? So now a few show updates. We have a Patreon. Now, Patreon is just a way that you can contribute a little bit, as little as a dollar a month, to your favorite shows or artists. And I'm still going to do this show indefinitely because I love doing it. But as soon as I have my first Patreon patron, I'm going to start doing Patreon-exclusive extra episodes every month. And, And like I said, just a dollar will get you into that feed. There's nobody there right now. So you could also be first. That money will always go into the podcast. And you can read a lot more about how exactly I intend to put that money into the podcast by visiting the Patreon page at patreon.com slash true crime review. You can also find other ways to support us, including using our Amazon affiliate link which costs you absolutely nothing at truecrimereview.net slash support. Okay, now an update on a past case. In episode four, we covered the case of Christopher Zoll. And you can go back and listen to episode four. The the long and the short of it is uh, that this gentleman disappeared under... And suspicious circumstances. Now, somebody named uh, Rich Leu posted the following comment on the YouTube video for episode four. I publish every episode to YouTube as a video, usually just with the cover art um, as the visual. So he, uh, this gentleman left the following rather long, but I think important comment on episode four about Christopher Zoll. So I'm going to read this comment uh, verbatim. There are points where I'm not sure what he meant, but you can consider that mystery with me. So I'm just going to read it exactly as it is. Quote, As a friend of Chris Saul, I can add a little more. He had found an out-of-the-way field in a Monmouth County park off of Red Hill Road about two miles from the farm to grow his weed. He contended this was for medical research, but spent time in jail. P.I., hired by friends of Chris, feels his disappearance is related to the pot growing considering that all they found was the items you mentioned. Almost ones costly felt it was murder. The car had been sanitized. No dirt, hair, or fingerprints could be found to identify who he might have been with or where the vehicle might have gone. His brother is not a suspect. The farm was thoroughly searched, including the pond. The mother, who our lives there, husbands, has since sold the farm and lives in Red Bank. 
Texas was also brought into the investigation, but I'm not sure why. Unquote. Go have a listen to episode four if you want more information about the disappearance of Chris Saul. And while you're there, you can read all the info that I had found that I included in my original research. Okay, now on to the podcast recommendation. And this time, the podcast recommendation is going to be Crime in Sports by comedians James Petrogallo and Jimmy Wiseman. Wiseman? Wiseman. Now, while I was born and raised in a football household, go Eagles, and play baseball and basketball very poorly for many years, I'm just not that into sports. Sorry, Dad. But when you combine sports with true crime, you have my attention. Now, Peter Gallo and Wisman always bring serious research to the table and manage to be very funny without disrespecting the victims. So even if you're not a fan of sports ball of any kind, give Crime and Sports a try. It's a great listen, and because of the show's premise being based in sports, it's likely to cover a lot of crimes you've just never heard about on the broader true crime podcast circuit. I know most of the crimes they cover, uh, even the ones by relatively famous athletes, I've never heard about. So you can find Crime and Sports on Audio Boom. Podbean, iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. And I've got links to all that stuff that you can find in the show notes. Okay, now on to the news. Dylan Roof was found guilty on December 15th of 33 counts of federal hate crimes for the murder of nine churchgoers in Charleston, South Carolina on June 17th, 2015. Roof, acting as his own lawyer now that the sentencing phase of his trial has started, told a judge on December 28th that he will not call witnesses or present any other evidence which might mitigate against the death penalty. Video of his confession to FBI agents can be found on the True Crime Review YouTube channel. Dylan Roof murdered the following people whose names do not, do not get read enough, frankly. He murdered Cynthia Marie Graham Hurd, Susie Jackson, Ethel Lee Lance, DePayne Middleton Doctor, Clementa C. Pinckney, Taiwanza Sanders, Daniel Simmons, Sharonda Coleman Singleton, and Myra Thompson. Other victims who were injured include Felicia Sanders, Polly Shepard, and several others who remain unnamed for various reasons. Our next story is unrelated. On Monday, December 19th, the Spartanburg County Sheriff's Office, also in South Carolina, conducted its Shop of the Sheriff program, during which the children and families of homicide victims met with deputies to shop for Christmas presents. A total of 25 children were given up to $100 each, to pick out a present at a local Walmart. And again, still in South Carolina, but a totally unrelated story as well. On December 27th, State House Representative Chris Corley of Aiken County from Graniteville, South Carolina, was arrested for responding to his wife's accusations that he had been cheating on her by punching her in the face with a closed fist and pointing a gun at her. He then threatened to kill himself. He did all of these things in the presence of their two- and eight-year-old children. He was charged with first-degree criminal domestic violence, a felony that could get him ten years in prison. He was granted $20,000 bond and will be able to work while his charges are pending. Five Albuquerque teens were charged with murder in early December after backing over 47-year-old father of three boys, Hector Aguirre. Sorry if I messed that up. They ran him over with his own work van, killing him. They had stolen the van and scared the man off by pointing a gun at him while he held on to the windshield wipers of the vehicle, trying to stop the theft. They could have very easily gotten away from him, but decided to crush him under his own van anyway. Several of those charged had also been involved in a previous drive-by murder, the fatal shooting of a dog, and other crimes. Felton Liddell Humphreys Jr. was sentenced on December 9th to 69 years to life for stabbing his wife to death 
while she was holding their five-month-old daughter, whom Humphreys also deliberately stabbed. The child did survive, but 32-year-old Alicia Renee Williams died the next morning. A judge in Ithaca, New York, rejected the December 19th guilty plea of 38-year-old Justin Barkley in the shooting death of 52-year-old William Schumacher while the seasonal UPS driver was on a break from his overnight route. The judge rejected the guilty plea because Barkley said he thought he had murdered Donald Trump. The next hearing on the indictment is scheduled for January 6. New Jersey State Police arrested 32-year-old Jeremiah Monell on January 2nd for the murder on December 19th of his estranged wife and mother of his two children, 35-year-old Tara O'Shea Watson. Tara's stabbing death was allegedly witnessed by the couple's son, who then went to find help for his mother. Monell has been charged with homicide and weapons offenses. And now we are crossing the Atlantic and heading into Liverpool, England, to find our human garbage of the week. And this time, the human garbage of the week is Anthony Showers of Anfield, Liverpool, Merseyside in the United Kingdom. He was recently sentenced to life in prison with a 29-year minimum. On June 12, 2016, he broke into the home of mother and daughter Karen and Jade Hales, 53 and 28 years old, respectively, by breaking a rear bedroom window. Showers had dated Jade on and off, but had been banned from her home by a court order following a domestic abuse incident. He began by killing their dog with a hammer. Showers then took the hammer to Jade, hitting her in the head 12 times, and then, either while she was dying or very soon after she was dead, raping her. Afterward, he found Karen, again her mother, downstairs. Karen was a stroke survivor who used a walker and had to depend on Jade for day-to-day care. He beat Karen to death with the same hammer he had used to kill her daughter. Jade's 21-year-old sister, Amanda, told the court the following. Quote, The day she met Anthony saw Jade change from a fun-loving young woman to a scared, frail person. I watched him take every last piece of her until there was no more to take. So Anthony Showers is the worthless, stinking, rancid, putrid human garbage of the week. Okay, this episode's episode. That sounds like a really cool podcasting weapon. If podcasting was an RPG of some kind. I might be onto something there. If you're a game maker for iOS, please get in touch. Episode Episode 2. Podcasters Revenge. Revenge. I guess we should make one first. Anyway, this episode's resource is an app called Safety Central, and it was produced by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. It's available on both iOS and Android, and the app is a simple but potentially powerful tool that all parents should take a look at. Here's a quote from the iTunes description. Developed by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, the leading nonprofit in the fight to keep children safe, Safety Central is designed to make sure that parents have the tools they need to help them protect their families and act quickly should their children go missing. At the core of Safety Central is a digital child ID kit. One of the most important tools for law enforcement when searching for a missing child is an up-to-date, good-quality photo, along with descriptive information. A child ID kit is a simple yet effective way to keep those tools right at your fingertips. The app, which does not share any of your personal information, reminds you when it's time to update your photos and allows you to store potentially life-saving information about your children in an easily accessible location. Unquote. So you can get Safety Central for free on iOS or Android, and you can visit NECMEC at missingkids.com. Now, it might seem a little, I don't know, silly or kind of a long shot to be occasionally updating a photo of your kid and, uh, you know, a, a description of what they look like, but it really is extremely important. And 
we all want to think that our kid is never going to go missing. You know, our niece is never going to go missing. Our grandchild is never going to go missing. And the fact is that every single kid that goes missing, right? That's somebody's kid. That's somebody's niece. That's somebody's grandchild. So it can happen to you. It frankly does happen to you. It happens to people just like you and me all the time. This is an app that takes five minutes to download and load up with a photo and a quick description. And everybody knows the old cliche because it's true. The first 48 hours are always going to be the most important. So this is a very good thing to have. Go to iOS or Android's uh, app stores and make sure that you download Safety Central. And the cold case this time is going to be Sherry Vanessa Holland. Now, we discussed the murder of Sherry Holland by Stephen Spears in Episode 9. But as one blogger notes, and I'll put a link in the show notes, the disappearance of Sherry Vanessa Holland involved a different woman altogether than the woman that was killed by Stephen Spears. So please note that while I've rewritten what follows and added and subtracted elements of the story based on my own research, a lot of the info, most of the info, I would say, comes from the Charlie Project and the tireless work of Megan Good over there at the Charlie Project. So a huge thanks to her. I think that she powers a lot of these podcasts and she is doing very tedious, difficult, but ultimately absolutely vital work. So go visit the Charlie Project and our thanks go out to Megan Good. Sherry Vanessa Holland was born on May 9th, 1962, and she was 34 years old when she was reported missing on August 16th, 1996. She is a white woman with blonde hair, blue eyes, weighed 115 pounds, and was 5 feet 5 inches tall when she disappeared. She had a scar on her left arm, and she had pierced ears. Holland had had cosmetic facial surgery in 1995, and some agencies may refer to her erroneously as Vanessa Sherry Holland. Sherry was in Flager, or Flager, I think it's Flager Beach, Florida, where she owned a vacation property, and she was preparing to return home to Atlanta, Georgia when she was last seen between 11.30 a.m. and 12 p.m. Her sisters reported her missing when she did not arrive in Atlanta. Her vehicle, a gold or champagne-colored 1987 BMW 325i with Georgia plate BKT664, was discovered on August 24th, according to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, or 25th according to some other sources. This was in 1996, and the car was discovered near Exit 76 between Macon and Atlanta, Georgia. It was on I-75 northbound, located in Morrow, Georgia. It had a flat as a result of a nail that was in the front right tire. Now, an Atlanta Journal-Constitution article dated... August 20th, 2001, says Sherry's car was a 1985, not a 1987. So it's not really clear which year is correct. I found no definitive sort of primary sources, like police reports. It's worth noting that the same article states Sherry was last heard from on August 16th, 1995. Even though GBI records and all other sources I could find state the year was 96. So... Bottom line is, there may be some questions about how well the AJC article dated August 20th, 2001 was fact-checked. Just keep that in mind. Two miles from the car in Riverdale, Georgia, near the Stratford Arms Apartments, Sherry's dogs were found in a field. Sadly, one of them had died after being hit by traffic, but one of them was rescued and went on to live with Sherry's twin sister, Terry. 
Yes, I know. A resident of the Stratford Arms told police the surviving dog, named Gracie, had tried to get him to follow her into a wooded area across the street from the apartment complex. However, further investigation revealed no evidence about Sherry in that area. There must have been other search sites, though. According to that, again, kind of dubious AJC article from 01, as many as, quote, seven searches of woods, ponds, and a vacant warehouse, some with cadaver dogs within a three-mile radius of Holland's car, turned up nothing, unquote. An anonymous tipster told investigator Sherry was seen near her car loading luggage into a white pickup truck on the day she vanished. Further investigation revealed no additional evidence, and police could never corroborate that tip. Now, Sherry was apparently operating an escort service called Atlanta Supermodels out of her house the year she disappeared, and her business partner told investigators during an interview that the two had been in business since 1992, and he believed her murder was related to their work. The business partner spoke of Sherry in the past tense. He claimed she had set up video surveillance around the escort services property, so I guess around the house they were running it out of, and had caught both employees and clients on video, which she later used to blackmail them. The business partner claimed to have heard many people discuss killing Sherry. Sherry had started dating a married man in 1989. The man and his wife separated briefly in 1990, but eventually got back together. Sherry and the boyfriend had planned to marry in December 96, but the boyfriend got cold feet and stayed with his wife. Apparently, at least according to the boyfriend, his wife never knew about his affair with Sherry. The boyfriend told police he and Sherry had argued about their relationship before she left for her vacation home in Florida. Having parted ways without resolving the argument, Sherry paged him around 11.30 a.m. the day she was last heard from, and when he called her back, she told him that she would call him when she got back to Atlanta. And that was the last time he ever spoke to her. He says... Now, several people told investigator Sherry was depressed about things with this boyfriend and wanted out of the escort business. She had apparently mentioned Europe as an escape destination. Someone later gave authorities a recording of a phone call from September 1996 in which one of Sherry's sisters says to an unidentified second person that it's possible Sherry staged her own disappearance and escaped to Europe or elsewhere to start over. A forum user going by the name A New Day and claiming to have been an employee of Sherry's posted on the missing persons forum Porchlight and suspects Sherry's business partner, whom A New Day calls Jim. And this is a quote. I remember Sherry very well. She was beautiful, sweet, and had a very sophisticated air. I love the picture of her and Gracie when Gracie was a puppy. I worked for Sherry for four years, but mostly knew her through her business partner. The whole time I worked there, she had very little to do with the business and was out of, t- out of town a lot of the time. I told the GBI everything that I knew about her and her disappearance, including the fact that Jim had acted extremely nervous and sketchy during the days following her disappearance. I don't believe for one second that she was using video to blackmail her employees or their clients. If anyone did that, it was Jim. He had a whole suspicious backstory of who he was and where he came from. I'm fairly sure his name wasn't Jim, either. When he told me about her disappearance, he said she probably just wanted to leave town to get away from her life, and also to make her boyfriend worry about her. It was well known that she was devastated about their relationship problems. I never trusted anything about Jim. He would say terrible things about her, but at the same time pretty much lived on her dime and the business she had started. It wouldn't surprise me at all if he had finally decided to, quote-unquote, take the business all for himself. It was very profitable, and being that it was all under the table, he probably figured no one would take much notice. I look online year after year to see if anything has come of the case. She was, parentheses hopefully is, such a vibrant person. She positively radiated with life. I hope she is living in Europe and is finally happy. 
God bless you, Sherry. Unquote. Now, A New Day created their forum account on the same day they posted that message, and they never posted anything else at Porchlight. So this info should probably be taken with a shaker, a whole shaker of salt, but interesting nonetheless. Okay, on to motives for this disappearance. We'll discuss all the motives I found in my research or came up with myself to make Sherry disappear. Now, this section should probably be called suspect, but I'm not really in a position to suggest anyone is guilty of anything, so I am just reluctant to call it that. These are motives, not suspects. Wink, wink. Okay, motive number one. Sherry's business partner, Jim, had a couple of possible motives. First, if the rumors are true that Sherry was blackmailing clients and employees, she could have been damaging the business, driving Jim to get rid of her to save the business. Alternatively, if Porchlight Forum member A New Day is to be believed, Jim may simply have grown tired of Sherry's absentee management and decided to take the business for himself. But while A New Day claims Jim is acting, quote, extremely nervous and sketchy after Sherry disappeared, he could have been acting like that because he expected the investigation would lead authorities to his illegal escort service. That alone would be enough to be nervous about, even if Jim had had nothing to do with Sherry's disappearance. Motive number two. Sherry's married boyfriend also may have had a motive. If Sherry threatened to tell his wife about their affair, if he didn't marry Sherry like they had planned, there's no evidence she did that. I'm just posing theories. Sherry had threatened to tell his wife. Then the boyfriend may have felt his recently reconciled marriage was in danger and took the extreme step of making Sherry disappear to save his marriage. We don't even know his name, though, so it's hard to speculate on anything about his past or his personality or whether he even had the opportunity to do anything to Sherry or to hire an uninvolved third party to do it for him. Motive number three. If Sherry's boyfriend's wife had found out about the affair, despite his claims that she didn't know, her anger and jealousy may have motivated her to bring harm to Sherry herself, to demand her husband do it, or to hire an uninvolved third party to do it for them. Now, I'm going to give the GBI the benefit of the doubt here, even though I couldn't confirm it anywhere, that they talked to Sherry's boyfriend's wife. If they didn't, that's an incredibly amateurish investigative oversight. She would have told them whether or not she knew about the affair. And even if she hadn't told them one way or the other, I bet her initial reaction to the news would have demonstrated enough to investigators for them to decide whether or not she had known previously. So these next two motives are, in my opinion, weak, but I'm including them for the sake of being thorough. So motive number four, Sherry may have decided to escape her failed relationship and increasingly unwanted job by going to Europe, never to be heard from again. Now, the reason this is very unlikely to me is because she had no reason to abandon her car on the highway and even less reason to abandon her dogs. She could have left the dogs with one or more of her sisters and simply taken a cab to the airport. So that just doesn't work for me from the very beginning. Now, related to this theory is a lead mentioned in the 2001 AJC article I mentioned earlier. And this is a quote. Then there was a man who told investigators he had gone to college in Cobb County with Holland and recognized her on an Atlanta-bound airline flight from Texas last November. He went up and spoke to her and the woman looked up at him and went back to reading a book. She refused to speak. GBI agent Fred May said, unquote. Okay, now this is more total conjecture on my part, something I love to do. But I would imagine most people would politely say no or angrily say leave me alone, depending on their personality type, rather than just sort of look up at him blankly and ignore him. But annoyance may explain her refusal to speak at all, I guess. 
This sounds like something that may have actually happened to this woman more than once, based on her reaction. She probably looked very similar to Sherry. It's very unlikely, in my opinion, that this was Sherry. I mean, after all, why make yourself vanish to go no further than Texas? And why risk returning to Atlanta if he wants so badly to get away from everyone and everything you knew? She certainly wasn't returning to reunite with friends or family because this sighting occurred in November 2000, and she hasn't been seen by anyone that we know of since 1996. Okay, motive number five. Serial killer Gary Michael Hilton may have counted Sherry among his victims. Web Sleuths member Figtree theorizes that several similarities between Sherry and Hilton's victims suggest a connection. For example, Hilton told police during his confession of the January 2008 murder of Meredith Emerson that he could not bring himself to kill Emerson's dog and had let it go a few miles from the crime scene. Also, Hilton lived 22 minutes from Sherry's Georgia residence and had killed at least one person, Cheryl Dunlap, in Florida. Dunlap's car had been found by the side of the road with a flat tire, something Hilton had done with a knife. But Hilton confessed several murders to authorities, so why not Sherry's? I respect Figtree's interest in the case and that some of we have. Sometimes we have gut feelings that we just can't shake, but I'm just not getting that feeling here myself. I mean, I've watched, listened to, or read transcripts of seriously more than six hours of investigative interviews and interrogations and confessions with Hilton in an effort to give this theory my full attention. I just, I just don't see it. But if you want to dive deeper into the Hilton theory put forward by Figtree, you can find all the documents and the videos about Hilton himself at HiltonEvidenceDocuments.blogspot.com. As for my theory, I wish I had a good theory on this one, but first I'll just tell you what I think did not happen. I don't think she ran away to Europe, and I don't think she was murdered by Gary Michael Hilton. I also don't really see his, her boyfriend or his wife getting involved in a disappearance or a murder without drawing significant attention from investigators, and I couldn't find anything naming them as suspects or making more than a brief mention about them. It's frankly hard for me to believe a couple who could barely keep their marriage intact managed to commit the perfect murder and haven't been suspected of it during the 20 years since. Now, as for the two possibilities that look like possibilities to me. First, I do agree with Figtree on Web Sleuths that it could have been a killer, a serial killer. Fukua DeWalt Cashaw was arrested at his home in Texas on February, in February 2015 for the 1999 murder of 22-year-old Heather Danielle Davidson in Georgia. And this, this guy came up in the thread fig tree was putting forth their theory in and the last we heard of cashaw he was out on bond after pleading not guilty to davidson's strangling death according to click to houston.com cook county illinois court records show in 1990 cashaw was found guilty of murder and second degree murder in 2003 he was found guilty of unlawful use of a weapon And in 2004, he was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter and concealment of a homicidal death. So he's got both prior convictions and present charges that indicate he's capable of murder. And Davidson's body was found on a small and desolate stretch of Georgia Road by a passerby by accident. Now, a tendency to take victims somewhere out of the way isn't something every serial killer does. Right, we all know, for example, John Wayne Gacy just stuck him under the floorboards at his house. But a tendency to take victims somewhere out of the way may explain why no sign of Sherry has been found at any of the leads uncovered by investigators. Because they were all derived from some connection to Sherry, like where her car was found or where her dogs were found. A Fox 5 article quotes Lieutenant Darrell Powers of the Butts County Sheriff's Office as saying, Through the evidence that we've recovered and the witnesses we've interviewed, we believe that there are possible other victims of Cashaw out there. 
So that prompts me to keep this theory on the table, however tenuous I do think it probably is. My second theory is that Sherry got a flat tire heading home from Florida to Georgia, and an unknown assailant kidnapped or murdered her in a crime of opportunity. Uh, This one is admittedly not as compelling as the Cashaw theory, but unfortunately, at least in my opinion, it's at least as plausible. That's all I have on Sherry Vanessa Holland. If you have any information at all relating to the disappearance of Sherry Vanessa Holland, however minuscule, however pointless, you saw her in a gas station the day she was last seen, anything. Contact Morro Police at 770-960-3003 or the GBI tip line at 1-800-597-8477. All right, thank you very much for listening to this episode of True Crime Review. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at True Crime Review, on Reddit at r slash True Crime Review, and on Twitter at True Crime REV. Go to truecrimereview.net slash subscribe to subscribe and get all of our new episodes when they're released. Please, if you're an iTunes user, also leave a review. If you like the podcast, and can honestly leave a five-star review, that will be glorious because reviews will help us move up the charts and by moving up the charts, we will get more listeners. Theme music is Our Planet is Lost by Entropy Audio. You can find more at entropyaudio.bandcamp.com. This is your host, Joe, signing off this episode of True Crime Review. Until next time, remember... Families deserve truth, and victims deserve voices.